certainly not the complete list. Um, uh, this is an intensive collaboration with Abhinav Valara, who is also here in this, uh, in this um, audience. And I hope that he will stay until the very end and actually also be able to answer some of uh, your questions. And I would actually also like him to step in because he did a lot of work here. At the same time, I need to apologize that I can't stay until the very end of this workshop. I'm in Germany right now. And at the same time, I have a, at a family celebration. So I actually had to step out from the celebration and to give this talk here. And I have to go yeah, back to <laughs> and uh, sorry for that. But uh, like, uh, if you should have questions, don't hesitate to just uh, ask me and talk to me. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, basically two tasks in, in perception. And the ones that I'm going to focus about today is semantic segmentation and a little bit of uh, detection. Um, detection will be at the very end, but it will also be very, very cool. So please stay tuned and stay until the end of the talk. Um, so, um, and what I'm going to start with is uh, some work that we have been done, uh, been doing recently uh, about robust semantic segmentation by domain ad adaptation. And in particularly, we looked at the, the question of how can we actually leverage uh, thermal cameras for better semantic segmentation, in particularly in, in, in difficult situations for normal RGB cameras. So for example, when it comes to uh, low light situations like at night or so. And uh, this is a work that uh, we published last year at IROS. And uh, I want to briefly like present the, the, the results here. So what you can see on the left-hand side is a typical uh, night uh, scene where we have a sequence of images. And on the right-hand side, we have a standard semantic segmentation network uh, applied to that uh, to these night images. And as you can see, uh, the performance is not really great. Um, at the same time, you need to be aware that if you get the task of labeling a night image and assigning a class to every pixel, that's going to be extremely painful because uh, it takes forever to figure out what this dark uh, spot in the 2D plane might belong to. So figuring out or labeling such images is extremely expensive. And uh, so the idea of this work basically is to, to leverage daytime semantic segmentation and another modality to actually bootstrap uh, semantic segmentation also for nighttime. So, and uh, just to give you an intuition, um, why that might be promising, here's a typical night uh, scene as well from Freiburg. And uh, what we are doing now is we are basically overlaying this with uh, the corresponding thermal images. And from that, you can get the impression already that uh, thermal in infrared images actually show a substantially smaller domain gap between the day and nighttime. And the question is, can we leverage that situation in order to train better, um, better semantic segmentation approaches? So, so the idea here was to basically uh, train that what we call a multimodal heat net that takes RGB and thermal images and creates uh, a segmentation map for uh, day and nighttime images at the same time. And at the same time, we want to actually leverage all the information that we have already, all the knowledge that we have for, for example, daytime uh, semantic segmentation approaches. And this is how this works. You're basically having a teacher-student architecture where we take a standard RGB teacher that we trained on the mapillary data set um, and, uh, on, um, on, and, and applied them to the, the, the RGB images that we got. And what we actually want is that our heat net, at least for daytime images already, like performs in a similar fashion as the teacher. That's obvious. That's something that we want to have. And in order to capture the case for an, uh, the, the, for the night uh, time as well, we basically introduced a domain a discriminator where we uh, basically try to mimic the same behavior for the nighttime images as the, the, the network shows for the daytime images. So the idea is basically, and this is what is the outcome of this, uh, this law, part of the loss function over here, that it basically, that the segmentation for nighttime images looks like uh, segmentation for daytime images as well. And this is the, the, the key idea of, of this approach, of this heat net approach. And uh, the, um, the data set that we generated is an own Freiburg thermal data set that we generated with our car that has uh, a rig of sensors on the roof, but the most important ones are the two RGB cameras and a, a thermal camera that we have here. Uh, we co collected uh, 
uh, five day and three nighttime collections over multiple seasons, summer to winter, 12,000 daytime images, 8,000 nighttime images, plus GPS, IMU, LiDAR point clouds. Uh, and we created also the poor students created 64 evaluation images, which was uh, extremely painful for them, as I mentioned before. And here's a, a, a small fraction of this data set. We can actually show the um, on the left hand side the RGB and on the right hand side uh, the thermal images. And uh, when you apply this and uh, this approach, then you would expect that uh, it actually performs pretty well on daytime uh, images as well. All right. So here, for example, you can and the first row is for daytime uh, the for daytime RGB image, the corresponding thermal image. There's actually one guy that looks like having COVID-19, like being a really, really red in the image. I don't know. So um, there's an uh, that would be the output. Of, that was the output of the RGB teacher. And this is the output of the heat net RGB uh, thermal image. And on the right hand side, you see the ground truth. But what you also can do, you can actually also add, train this, this network to actually perform on the RGB images as well. And basically, without the thermal uh, input, which is pretty important because thermal cameras are, are expensive. And that what you actually would like to have is, in the end, having a network that is able to train to 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 deliver results on on the RGB image and, and independent of as to whether it's day or night. This is actually also a, a cool out, outcome of this of this architecture. And this is something that you can see in the bottom here. You can see basically a nighttime scene, a relatively clear thermal image. Um, the output of the RGB teacher, which is pretty bad, uh, RGB T uh, looks really, really good, close to the ground truth. But also, what you can see is that in a heat net without thermal information can also be trained in a way that it, uh, it produces really uh, accurate outputs and way better than the the RGB teacher. Here's a, a video showing the performance on uh, on, a, on a few uh, images. So this starts with the day scene. Um, where things look relatively easy, but then it gets into a night scene. And uh, what you can see is that the, um, the I mean, this bicyclist is hardly visible to the human eye, uh, that uh, the segmentation is actually pretty good in this case. Um, there's also some, some quantitative evaluation that I can show. So this is basically the comparison to, to a supervised approach. Uh, and um, which in fact uh, is uh, outperforms our uh, our approach in, uh, in this case, uh, but at the same time we are we're getting like really really close uh, on on our own data sets when we test the the systems on our data sets and even have like comparable outputs there and uh, the the numbers for um, for the um, for the heat net in the, on the Freiburg data set actually look really really great. Um, so, so this is like the, the idea of using uh, uh, like thermal cameras to help transferring capabilities from daytime to nighttime. Um, and what we are going to do next is look into, into sound and basically asking as to whether we can do a similar thing for visual terrain classification using acoustic uh, feature learning. And this is um, a technique that Yannick Abinav and Abinav have uh, mostly worked on and that has recently been uh, published at the IEEE transactions on robotics. This is something, a problem that I've always been interested in and it is somehow uh, has been not paid a lot of attention to in the past. I call this uh, listen to your tires and the idea there is basically to understand on what type of terrain you're moving simply by using your sound. Right? So this would be by using the sound. So when we drive our cars, we can often tell in winter as to whether we are driving on snow um, or on, 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 on a paved, uh, on, on, on asphalt, simply based on the sound that we are hearing or, or the interaction sound between the tires and, and the asphalt or the, the, the surface. And um, the question here is uh, as to whether we can not only leverage this for, uh, for better classification, but as to whether we can also use this to bootstrap a vision-based classifier to actually learn uh, a, a proper segmentation uh, or solve a segmentation task uh, in, in a visual way. And uh, this is basically the idea of, of this paper. So um, what we want to have is um, the ability to perform that what we call in robotics 
terrain adaptive planning like so usually like you do not want to go over the grass right so you want actually to stay on on, on the pavement or on the asphalt um if, because for example a robot might get stuck but also you even humans don't always like it because you might get wet feet right and then when it rains a lot like it does these days in germany so um what we want to have is we want to have some sort of segmentation that tells us what the, uh, the, the type of the surface might be uh, the vehicle is moving on and uh, again manual annotation doesn't really scale and is super expensive and the idea of this approach is to basically uh, use unsupervised audio feature learning uh, from the interaction sounds uh, to to self-supervise a visual terrain classifier and um, the idea here is basically to take the robot trajectory uh, project them uh, after like a slam approach that we perform and the mapping of these um, images that we perceive with the camera into uh, 2D and map the, the trajectory into these uh, surface images and in this way get uh, weekly labeled images and then um, train a terrain segmentation network that is able to actually then in the end segment the, the terrain out of it. And for this we are basically um, performing like a self-supervised approach um, where we basically embed the patches uh, of the ground with the CNN and then cluster them and then perform uh, form triples of samples based on local neighborhood of patches in the embedding space. And then afterwards, um, use these triples, uh, uh, use triplets from a discriminative audio embedding space from the corresponding terrain real interaction sounds. And so basically what you can imagine this being is we are clustering the, uh, the sound signals um, and then based on the mapping from the labels that we get or the, the so to say the weak labels by the path projected on onto the images, we actually can get a corresponding mapping to the image patches and use this as a, a, as a training input for, for the network. And based on this, like here's a, again a data set where you can actually see the robot moving on the fiber campus over grass, uh, um, different terrains. Um, the images are recorded at two hertz and the audio sample at 44 hertz. On the right hand side, you see the vehicle. Camera is over here, and there we do have a microphone on the back of the vehicle. So the vehicle actually, when it moves forward, it moves to the right. Okay. And um, so it is, um, and the, the classes that are found basically by clustering automatically, in this case are asphalt, grass, cobblestone, parking lot, and gravel, corresponding to the actually the classes that we are uh, we were interested in. Um, and the interesting aspect here is that some of these terrain classes have actually similar appearance, while others are, have uh, similar audio signatures, and still the system is able to actually nicely disambiguate them. Here's a, 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 a numerical or a quantitative evaluation. So um, here, like what you see is a pretty high performance, not reaching the completely supervised approach, but uh, actually being pretty strong uh, in performance and better than uh, the baseline on, on the left. Um, so um, basically what that shows is that we are able to actually learn these terrain classes just by clustering uh, these uh, sound signals. And um, even in, in more complex scenes, and even when there are shadows, but there is a, this is actually a video over here where you can actually see also some false classifications, and particularly when there, there are shadows. And there's also some ambiguity here, because there, as we can see, there is no uh, sharp transition between grass and, and, and cobblestones. Right? we see here but after the robot does a left turn right now then you also see like really um, like strong shadows uh, that are often then uh, confused with cobblestone and it's extremely hard to to actually uh, get these classes correct what is interesting about this now is that um, first of all here is also in, in a sequence of uh, the clustering where you can actually see how the system nicely separates the individual um, uh, classes in the audio embedding space. Um, what you can do now is you can also um, transfer this to, to, to novel domains. So for example, when you go to a different environment, 
um, where you might have a different appearance, but the sounds are, are similar. And uh, here you can actually basically retrain your network uh, based on, uh, on, the, on, on, on the sound signals that you already have and um, or the sound classifier that you already have. And um, that's what we call fine tuning. And then we can actually get better classification results uh, uh, with fine tuning uh, the network afterwards rather than without. Uh, so, and uh, in fact, we, us as a roboticist, like I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, as roboticists, we are interested in, in the ability to perform terrain adaptive planning and introduce higher costs for moving uh, over grass rather than over uh, paved uh, road or over pavement. And this is what then a standard A star planner, for example, can generate. Uh, depending on how, in th that case, act actually the, uh, the the parameters have been set of of the individual costs. So um, this about this this uh, so far about this uh, sound base. We will come back to this later. Um, but we are going to talk about uh, semantic segmentation again, and this is a work by Abinav, again Rohit, uh, our uh, IG, IJCV paper self-supervised model adaptation for multimodal semantic segmentation, where it is also about using multiple modalities for improving performance and also uh, for um, bootstrapping learning. And uh, again, here's an example for uh, semantic segmentation. I think uh, I do not need to go into the details and there's a lot of uh, like aspects where we do have challenges for using CNNs for semantic uh, scene understanding uh, without going in, in, into the details here. But what I would like to, to emphasize is that uh, we developed this AdaptNet++ architecture here with these efficient atrospatial pyramid pooling module and a novel detector topology uh, that uh, with high resolution refinement that actually um, um, shows a very, very high performance in these uh, in this uh, semantic segmentation task. The advantage of this um, um, actual special uh, pyramid pooling is basically that we do have a wider field of attraction here. It's basically a larger window that uh, or a larger receptive field that uh, this, this this uses and uh, that basically intru introduces the uh, or in increases the the robustness of the overall approach. And um, a few benchmarking results here, Cityscapes, Cynthia, Sun, RGBD, Scanet, and also the Freiburg Forest data set. Um, you can basically see highly uh, accurate results. Um, the AdaptNet++ at that time um, showed pretty high performance, um, almost uh, at the top level, but with substantial uh, reduced, substantially reduced computation cost. So on the cityscapes leaderboard, uh, it actually on the ScanNet leaderboard, it made it to uh, number three uh, at that time. I think right now there's uh, like substantially better approaches, but when uh, we published this, this was actually the uh, one of the top uh, approaches at that time. Here's a qualitative uh, cityscapes result, and um, and results about this are also like in in the on this web page here, Deep Scene CS Unifrabook TE. If you want to have a look at it. The, um, we also applied this for terrain navigation for and real robots. So there is exact, that's exactly a similar uh, task that we uh, discussed before, where we actually want to uh, have the robots staying on, on paved roads or on this gravel or dirt roads in this case, sorry, uh, instead of going over, over grass or into the vegetation. And for that, you basically need to have these semantic segmentations uh, of the vicinity uh, of the images in the vicinity of the of the robot. The um, again, right? We do all know that uh, that there are still substantial challenges like seasonal uh, weather and lighting the conditions that might be really really challenging. And then there um, like things that we see here, but there are also other aspects that are extremely difficult. Like for example, this uh, tram here on the left-hand side with a picture of a person person uh, stuck to its uh, wall and even window. Um, and in fact, like a, a semantic segmentation network <clears throat> supposed to segment um, people 
like has no chance other than basically saying that this is a, a person there as well. Uh, I mean, unless we provide this these networks with uh, a more complex ontology and additional information, basically about uh, depth in this case, like where we basically, if the network would be able to tell that uh, people are not flat surfaces, then it would be easier to basically uh, understand that uh, this is a, just a picture and not a, uh, not a person. But there are also other aspects like here, for example, if you are under a bridge, then you have different exposures and uh, you know that um, the, 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 the front in, or the, the image in front of you or the camera might be um, disturbed because of the glare. And that is also something that uh, one could actually take into account in uh, semantic segmentation tasks. And here again, uh, the opportunity is to improve this robustness by using multiple modalities, like for example, RGB depth, variance of depth, uh, or near infrared, for example. And uh, the, this basically always comes with this question, like how can we exploit complementary features from these alternative uh, modalities? And I mean, this is, this brings us to this entire discussion of multimodal fusion, like where should we fuse, fuse and uh, how should we do it? Um, there is some evidence that we do have late fusion in the human brain. Uh, so there are people who are advocates of early fusion. Um, I, uh, I'm being like a probabilistic robotics person. There's not always something between one and zero. And I always think that uh, the right answer is uh, doing it in between and being flexible about fusion. And this is also something that is basically the outcome of this, uh, this approach here. Um, there's a few, a few other additional factors that might influence fusion, but um, the um, basically talked about this uh, as well. And the, the work that we have been doing in, 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 in particular also with Abhinav is that uh, where we actually looked at the fusion approaches is that uh, you need to be smart about fusion. And this is why uh, we developed this dynamic um, model adaptation unit that actually can uh, smartly uh, perform the, the fusion. You have also other approaches where fusion is not only done at the beginning or at the end, uh, but also in between where meaningful uh, patterns emerge from the, uh, from the or original data so that you can basically tell as to whether there's anything meaningful in that, in that image that uh, can help you perform with the fusion. And uh, yeah, so you basically end up having these huge fused feature maps and then in the end get these uh, semantic segmentations out of that and uh, i mean this with this fusion approach we are actually outperforming some of the uh, the, the, the individual uh, modalities as you can see here on the cynthia th seasons data set um, but we also uh, applied this to the cityscapes leaderboard uh, got pretty far uh, with uh, relatively great um, um, performance, but in this case, at that time, on the ScanNet leaderboard, we actually made it to number one. And um, yeah, so, um, so so this is kind of like something that you can obtain by being actually uh, achieved by being smart uh, about fusion and using these these multiple modalities in an efficient way. And here are a few uh, results in even adverse conditions, like in in simulation, but it is pretty impressive from my perspective what the outcomes here are, like in fork, rain, or, or snow. Um, let's see the outcome that we obtained with this approach. At the very end, um, I wanna like have three more slides and then we can hopefully jump into the discussion. It's a, a distillation approach of uh, multimodal information. And uh, from my perspective, this is something uh, really cool that Abhinav and his team has been doing. Uh, so I've not been involved in this. So and uh, not being involved into something allows you to be uh, pretty vocal about saying, hey, this is really, really cool. And check it out. It's a paper at CVPR this year. And uh, what is happening here in this approach is basically you're trying to do detections based on sound about where objects are. And um, in order to do this, we they basically used multiple modalities to train or to teach a, a network based on audio signals um, or to, to detect objects based on audio signals. So um, 
That's basically that what I told already. So here is uh, like RGB thermal um, in information that we utilize. We also have a LiDAR on top, an old fashioned one, but then we do have a ring of eight microphones um, and all this is synchronized. So we have RGB depth, thermal, thermal and audio modalities, 300 kilometer, kilometers of driving data, varying conditions, such as dawn, day, dusk and night. And uh, basically the task is to teach a network to, de to detect vehicles in uh, the audio stream and make predictions about where they are um, based on the signals that they, they perceive. And uh, this is how the, the architecture is. Like you basically see the RGB, thermal and, and depth input. And uh, you basically get uh, like these teachers that tell the audio student where to actually put these uh, predicting bounding boxes. And at the end, I just want to show. So here you can basically see bounding boxes generating by the audio network that basically tells just based on audio where the bounding box of the individual vehicles. This is pretty cool because uh, I have the feeling that I would be pretty unable from doing this, basically telling where these vehicles are um, and how many there are just based on, uh, on, on these audio streams. So coming to the end here, what I wanted to convince you about is uh, don't stick to one modality. Right? If you want to make uh, the per performance of one modality better, think about potentially using alternative modalities and uh, trying to uh, improve the, the and, and find a way to improve the performance of, of this one modality, potentially using others as well. And uh, also try to think a little bit more about how to fuse multiple modalities and how to also utilize them for, for domain transfer and so on and so forth. And that's it. And I hope that Abhinav is still there and can jump in and also show his face and answer some of the questions that might come up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Wolfram, for the very impressive uh, uh, presentation. A lot of great work. So, so the audience, do you have any questions? You can unmute your mic from that, that ask directly. Or you can type in the in the in the chat channel if, if you prefer. Maybe while we are waiting for question, I, I can start with one. Oh, look, you want to ask something? Or... Well, uh, I, I fully agree with the fact that we need fusion at multiple levels, like uh, early and late and middle and and everything. I think that is a very important idea. Um, I, I had a question about the thermal. Uh, Cameras, though, so that's beyond near infrared, so also beyond normal silicon. Um, I'm not sure what the current status is in terms of pricing and how difficult it is to handle those sensors. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I mean, we we spent quite some time into into the, the selection of these cameras, and uh, we were pretty pretty happy with the ones that uh, we had. Thermal cameras have made an enormous progress over the past years, and particularly because the uh, uh, automated driving space is so much interested into them. So they have been um, become extremely compact and uh, also pretty performant. And uh, I mean, um, for me, this is um, like is a pretty useful device. I mean, still relatively expensive, but um, also for for other aspects. Uh, very, very helpful. I mean, problems are still like calibrations and you know, you, you might have the, the drift in, in colors and so on and so forth. So that's something that I actually, because I'm not in, in so much into the depth of these details here, I can't tell you, but uh, this is one of the major issues as far as I know, the, the, the calibration of these cameras still. I was thinking about autonomous driving and of course you have to put it on a car and it must cost like one dollar or less. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that, that's something that they are supposed to cost, you know, I, I think the ones that we have are substantially more expensive. I, I do not know where the good ones are. I don't know. Abhinav, are you on the line here? Do you have any? Uh, yeah, so I think they're not so, exp I mean, not nearly expensive as a LiDAR, but more the problem is how they don't sell it very easily because they are extensively used for military purposes. You have to first get approved. I mean, the companies are in the US, like Fleur especially. So it's kind of get 
uh, you have to go through a process for them um, to, to, you know, let you buy them outside the U.S. Because they're all ITAR, um, they come under the trade regulations. Mm. But I think they're not so expensive. So I think for us, it took about six months to just get the approval. And um, I, I, they're less than 5K. Um, you can get one of them, basically. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. like I think one of the challenges is, again, the calibration. So uh, in sunlight, it's, you know, you, it, when you move from shadow to a dark space, you can still see uh, them not getting good results. If you want consistent results throughout and outdoor conditions is again, a challenge of how do you dynamically um, calibrate them to get um, yeah, decent performance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, sounds like they are still very much too expensive. <laughs> yeah. They're still too expensive for automotive, but they are uh, very, very attractive. I mean, there, there's so much f- functionality that you can realize with those sensors that are extremely hard in other cases. Like, for example, when you think about parked car detection, you know, is this car parked or is this a car that is actually still in traffic or an active traffic participant that is difficult? Um, or other things are pedestrians, in fact, you know, that uh, are also quite a challenge, in, in particular at far range or when pedestrians are very close to the vehicle and you only see parts like an arm or something like that that is extremely difficult with just like rgb yeah uh, well i think tubing and the max planck institute once did a study about accidents and indeed it's uh, difficult to detect pedestrians who are uh, yeah really in danger <laughs> and uh, yeah this this could help so it will, it will be interesting uh, to consider. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. We could actually ask one more question. So is, there, is there any question from the audience? If not, maybe I can ask one more question, maybe for the, the last part about the microphone that you try to detect uh, uh, the, the, the object is with, with this eight microphone, but how do you handle the, the, the wind noise? If you drive then at high speed, then you might have a lot of uh, wind noise, right? That could be an issue there. How do you, how do you handle that? Or, or you find that it actually is not an issue if you'll be suppressed by neural network uh, directly? I mean, I've go ahead. Yeah, so uh, this was a big concern when we were starting to think about this work. So initially, we actually got these um, wind mufflers, but it turns out that if you add these wind mufflers, which kind of um, filter out a lot of these wind noise, then it also filters out the same frequency of noises that you get from the cars. So then we just happened to try out without them and Surprisingly, the car noises are distinct enough from the noise of the wind. So the noise of the winds are more like uh, constant sort of noise, but the car is very distinguished in terms of, you know, the frequency response that you get in the spectrograms. So um, as far as we tried, we didn't have a problem, but of course you can all, you can, I mean, you can only use this method, you know, like something like 50-ish meters away from your microphones. And after that, your ambient noise just is, um, too much for it to uh, pick up anything. But here we just used, you know, really inexpensive, like 10 euro microphones. So it wasn't anything like fancy or um, uh, directional microphones. So it was normal uh, super, cord, super cord ride um, pattern microphones. Mm-hmm. 